Thank you. Thank you, uh, Business of Design Week, for giving us the uh, opportunity to speak uh, to you here today. Now, before Sarah introduces you to our Dun Huang project, uh, I'll, take a, I'll talk a little about the broader trajectory of our art-directed research over the last 20 years and its cultural heritage aspects. Now, the two core themes of this research are new modalities of visualization and proprioception, and new modalities of interaction and embodiment. During the 90s, certain foundational concepts and practices were introduced. The notion of corpathetics, uh, uh, a word uh, coined by Christopher Pinney, the art historian, the corporeal embodied aesthetics. This work, The Legible City, where one makes a is, is making a physical effort, so ex exercising one's uh, bodily energy to explore a virtual world, in this case, a an urban landscape that is transformed into text, so that instead of buildings, you have letters, instead of letters form words, sentences, so that one actually walks through a city that speaks to you. The notion of mixed reality, this work, the virtual museum. Um, one is moving around in a real museum space and at the same time navigating a virtual representation of that space. And within the virtual representation, one discovers various virtual exhibits in various galleries, which are all um, a series of clones of the space which you are in. The notion of inaction, perception in action, the conjunction of perception and action. This work, the expanded virtual environment, where the movement of one's head, the movements of one's point of view, allows you to explore a narrative space, a completely immersive surrounding uh, space of storytelling, but you control your window of view. You, in effect, are the director and the editor of the experience. And also, you are the performer of the experience on behalf of other visitors. Augmented reality the golden calf, uh, simply using the monitor as a window which uh, presents a virtual golden calf standing on top of a real pedestal and moving the monitor around in space reveals various aspects of that uh, virtual creature. Presence and immersion, configuring the cave. The ability of new media to completely immerse one in a space of representation that can extend to infinity in all directions around you. And where your presence and where your interaction actually modulates various parameters in that virtual world. Here a wooden mannequin with sensors in all its joints allows you to modulate uh, the transformations in the visual space, in the audiovisual space which surrounds you. Now I'll be talking about more recent art practices, especially those being carried out at our uh, CityU Alive lab. 
and especially those which have a, a heritage um, related focus. A work done at uh, Angkor, I think possibly one of the earliest examples, uh, a project by Sarah Kenderdine done at uh, using a um, especially modified camera to capture stereo uh, panoramic images at this uh, heritage site. Stereoscopic meaning left and right eye, 3D represent, uh, uh, photographic uh, representations of the space. And at the same time, beginning to explore different interpretive tools, such as uh, the recoloring of the, um, of the sculpture, uh, based on, on research as to what these, uh, these, um, these sculptures uh, probably looked like when they were, were originally uh, carved and painted. And also some very, um, I think, interesting examples in uh, strategies of augmentation, bringing these uh, places to life. You see the water, which is gently um, moving. Actually, there is no water there at the moment. It's an empty pool. So the water is virtually added to the scene and virtually animated. But just this very subtle augmentation of the situation brings it to life. A more recent work uh, that Sarah and I did together was at uh, Hampi, a UNESCO World Heritage Site in India. The work was originally commissioned for um, a uh, festival in Lille, in the north of France. It was a year of cultural exchange between France and India. And uh, this work was first presented at the um, Opera House in Lille, and you see a, a quite spectacular um, street decoration that was done for this uh, festival with the, these uh, elephants flown over from India. Um, Hampi is an extraordinary uh, archaeological site, but it's also a living pilgrimage site. Our work uh, is uh, another, um, let's say, um, research in, in terms of panoramic, stereoscopic um, documentation. But here we see it Im embodied in a 360 degree uh, projection environment. Um, we did the photographic capture using this uh, um, custom-made camera. It's uh, basically two cameras side by side. These are so-called slit cameras. They rotate 360 degrees and they generate uh, a pair of panoramic views, one for the left eye, one for the right eye. These in turn uh, are positioned in a virtual world uh, which represents the atmosphere of, uh, of Hampi. So each of these cylinders is, is basically one uh, 3D pair of, um, of photographs. Also, it, um, we took notions of augmentation uh, one step further from the Angkor project. Here, um, we actually uh, incarnate um, Hindu gods. In this case, uh, we worked with an Indian dancer we motion captured a, um, a dance uh, and then uh, animation studio in Bangalore created this figure of Shiva and we will see him dancing in, the, uh, in this uh, 3D environment. And also we, we were uh, doing ambisonic 360 degree uh, sound rec uh, recording on location. So this is the virtual world as one experiences it. Um, the installation uses a motorized platform which enables you to rotate your point of view in 360 degrees. And also, uh, there are um, 
use the controls which allow you then to move uh, forwards and backwards in the virtual world. One uses polarized uh, glasses to uh, achieve the 3D um, effect, to separate basically the left and right eye images, which are being concurrently projected on the screen. There is a, a map in front of you. Actually, the map is a, an image of the body of Hanuman. In the Ramayana, Hampi is the home of uh, Hanuman and his tribe, the monkey god. So you can drift around, you can travel around in this virtual environment, enter these cylinders, and each cylinder then is entering into a panoramic, a photographic, stereoscopic space. And on the uh, LCD screen in front of you, you actually see uh, your current location in the world. Here we are entering the particular cylinder where you will see uh, the figure of Shiva embedded in the environment. And we worked with uh, Dr. L. Subramaniam, an Indian um, composer and musician, for the musical uh, component of these, uh, of these um, situations. We did some uh, user studies in this work. We were very curious how a general public um, moves around and relates to uh, a work of this nature, which is quite, you know, in a way, experimental in terms of user experience. Um, and also, we were very interested in the relationship between an interactive work, which is both a single user interaction, but at the same time, a performance on behalf of a much larger uh, group of people. And we were also interested in, in uh, people's, uh, let's say, uh, corporeal reaction to the work. So we did uh, a survey where one of the questions was, where on your body did you experience this work? And we gave, put out, gave a little drawing of a human figure, and you see some of the responses. People are just drawing in, um, indicating where on their body they experienced the work. And that image on the right is the composite of all responses. So you see that, uh, of course, there's a concentration in, in the eyes and the head and the hands and the feet, but actually people are as uh, recording sensations in, in throughout, their, uh, throughout their body. This work recently was uh, commissioned again and uh, now permanently installed uh, in a cultural center called Kaladan, just 30 kilometers outside of, um, of Hampi, uh, built by uh, the Jindal Steel Corporation. You see the steel works in the background. Um, as an interpretation center uh, on behalf of uh, uh, the Humpy site itself. This is uh, at the opening of this uh, cultural center just uh, a few months ago. This is the entrance to the museum. Um, the actual installation has a number of, let's say, accompanying interpretive experiences, a, a satellite map of the whole Humpy area, um, we took a lot of photographs there, so we decided to make this enormous light table, and people can just explore the whole body of photography uh, just with magnifying glasses and just sliding them over the light table. This is the installation itself. And then another room is dedicated to the work of the archaeologists who spent over 25 years uh, excavating there and we just took random samples of images from their archive and just threw them onto a light table. And each one has a barcode, so you can just then scan them, put them on a barcode scanner, and then projects on the wall and gives you a little explanation about what these images are. So it's like rummaging around in the archaeologists' archive, in the history of their work there. And also, Sarah did uh, an interview with the, the two archaeologists, the key archaeologists, John Fritz and George Michel. But this, the, the actual uh, interview itself was recorded as a panoramic um, scene 
inside, uh, inside, the, uh, inside the museum. And I said to John, I can't show you any pictures, but I think there is this place which is really worth photographing. I think you should come. You didn't have a camera in those well, days? Well, I hadn't been just before that I didn't have anything on me to yeah. prove it to okay. John. I said, John, as they say, trust me. Uh, we did a, a project uh, not long after uh, using the same infrastructure uh, in Turkey, um, visiting numerous uh, heritage sites throughout Turkey. But here, we also uh, included a 360 degree panoramic uh, video recording of uh, intangible heritage um, events uh, such as these uh, dervish. Uh, dancing. And recently in um, Hong Kong, we've also been documenta doing documentation of intangible heritage of um, the Chinese cultural events, and in this case, uh, embedding these 360-degree uh, panoramic movies in something we call the eye dome, which is a 180-degree uh, a uh, hemispheric projection environment. And, uh, and you can rotate your point of view inside this, uh, this hemisphere. Uh, and looking at other strategies of re-embodiment and recording of uh, intangible heritage performance, um, we developed a, um, you could say, a visualization environment called Reactor. And here you see a work we did with a contemporary um, Japanese dancer, Saburo Teshigawara. So he is performing with his partner on a circular stage. Uh, and you see there are six cameras around him. Uh, these are 3D cameras, so we are, rec are recording his performance from six points of view in 3D. And then below you see the projection environment and with this, this uh, recording is given back to the viewer. It's a six-sided room, back projected, so that on each uh, wall of this room you see the uh, specific uh, 3D recording from that angle. And because it's 3D, you actually see the dancers as if they are inside that room. So you could say it's a somewhat uh, holographic um, or sort of holodeck-like uh, experience. Here are the, um, you see concurrently, all six uh, points of view, all six uh, directions of recording which in itself is a very interesting uh, uh, document. And then here it is as, uh, as it's uh, experienced by a viewer able to walk around this room, look through these windows into the room and see these dancers dancing, uh, seemingly dancingly, dancing inside, one to one scale, and then being able to walk around and view them from different points of view. A recent project involves a visualization of the Western Han tombs. I'll just show this to you briefly. Uh, at this location, laser scanning and uh, uh, high-resolution photography is being done. And we are using a 360-degree 3D visualization environment to be able to uh, reconstruct the experience of, uh, of visiting uh, these, uh, these tombs. And also, um, using the um, point cloud data uh, from the laser scans, specifically uh, point cloud data related to objects, objects around and objects found within these tombs, we are also able to reconstruct an experience of actually a kind of a virtual gallery of, uh, of objects that have been found in these tombs. And these are set against the, uh, the sort of the magic of this uh, point cloud data universe. Tvisionarium, uh, a work that explores the, um, 
the opportunity to, within a, a 360 degree environment, a, um, present a, uh, an enormous body of audiovisual data. This is, of course, the uh, Abby Warburg's uh, model of, of exploring associations between images, but now we are able to distribute these images in a 3D, 360 degree space, and also by means of metadata, uh, create associations between images. So in a, in a way, it's a kind of, you could say a kind of audiovisual Google search engine where you have uh, um, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of, uh, of images, video clips, uh, any kind of audiovisual database uh, being linked with metadata and with certain, uh, let's say, navigation strategies, which one can offer the, uh, the viewer. And this project then extended in a recent uh, work with the Europeana, eCloud, where we are working with, uh, here we are working with crowdsourced data uh, in relation to uh, the anniversary of the First World War. Um, Europeana asking people to look in their uh, attics for uh, diaries, postcards, uh, objects, uh, memorabilia, collecting all this together. And then we created a, uh, a uh, interactive visualization environment which allows one to uh, navigate this, uh, these materials. Using word clouds, image clouds, uh, metadata associations, uh, groups of images, image groups coming from particular um, donors. Another work we're currently working on is uh, a project uh, on the Tripitaka Koreana, the Korean Buddhist canon. I'll just quickly show you that we're looking for strategies in which this uh, enormous uh, body of text can be visualized not just on a screen, but also within a completely immersive environment. So in effect, we sort of digitally reconstruct the experience of, of being immersed uh, in, the, uh, in the text as, as, uh, as in the woodblock text, but now in a in a, a virtual library. And the last work I'd like to show you is the work we are currently engaged in uh, for the Hong Kong Maritime Museum. And here, looking at the problematic of how to uh, represent uh, um, traditional Chinese uh, scroll paintings. Uh, this is a, a wonderful scroll painting which the, uh, which the Maritime Museum has in its, its collection which is 18 meters long, uh, 55 centimeters high, uh, something which would normally be rotated to look at, to travel, to explore its, uh, its narrative. Now, of course, not accessible to, to a, a public because of its fragility. So we are looking at ways in which we can uh, bring that into our 360 degree panoramic space, but also create various new kinds of augmentation, like, um, creating interactive mists, which as one moves around exploring the, uh, the, um, the scroll, one actually opens the mist to uh, reveal certain scenes and certain narratives. And also looking at other strategies of augmentation which involve uh, zooming in to certain details um, let's say, without actually um, altering the scroll, the scroll itself, but creating a digital layer as a sort of digital, uh, uh, you could say, magnifying glass that comes out on top of the scroll so that then this is the component where one can animate certain, you know, sort of key events in, uh, in the scroll experience. And also looking at other strategies, when one has an 18-meter scroll, which is just dense with, uh, with narrative uh, events, uh, looking for ways to, uh, you say, digitally compact this. Here we distribute it over a 5-meter uh, um, trajectory uh, using LC uh, vertical LCD screens and multi-touch screens so that basically you comp take the 18 meters, 
compress it, and then but still allow people via the multi-touch interface to uh, navigate, explore, and zoom into very, very fine detail. And also, um, we've had the opportunity to uh, digitize this scroll at extraordinary high resolution, uh, 1,200 DPI, so that we are able to zoom in virtually into the, uh, the brush strokes of the painting. This brings to a conclusion my um, introduction to uh, Susara's uh, presentation uh, about the Dunhuan Caves. Thank you very much for your... Um, Good morning. The research we are doing involves the use of advanced imaging tools such as laser scanning, close range photogrammetry, GIS, 3D modeling, gigapixel imaging, and array photography. Imaging data at World Heritage Sites is fundamental to archaeological conservation and preservation processes. This high resolution data is accumulating daily by the tetrabyte. One of our uh, recent works explores the latent potential of these massive data sets. Pure land inside the Magal grottos at Dung Wan is the subject uh, of my discussion today. It's also an artwork that you can go and visit during Business of Design Week at the Run Run Shore Creative Media Center built by Daniel Lieberskin. Pure Land is a collaboration between Alive and the Dungwan Academy based on the World Heritage Site in Gansu Province, Gobi Desert, in northernmost China. Dungwan is a nexus of the Silk Road. Known as the Cave Temples of a Thousand Buddhas, this complex has 45,000 square meters of surviving frescoes and more than 2,000 stucco statues in 492 caves. Inside each cave is an art treasury abounding with paradisical frescoes, hand-molded clay sculptures of savior gods and saints. They are in size and historical breadth like nothing else in the Chinese Buddhist world. Inside each cave at Dungwan, the wealthy merchant donor who paid for its painting and embellishments are depicted on the walls. The Pure Land Project of today wishes to thank its donor, uh, Mr. Gabriel Yu, and the Friends of Dung Wan, Hong Kong. As a World Heritage Site, it's under the uh, jurisdiction of UNESCO and the Chinese government. The Dung Wan Academy are appointed as the custodians, and there are over 600 full-time staff. The library cave, Cave 17, contained 15 cubic meters of manuscripts and paintings, most of which were removed by explorer archaeologists, including Arl Stein, seen here on the right-hand side inside the cave. These artifacts are now distributed in major libraries and archives around the world and are digitally repatriated through the International Dungwan Project at the British Library. Uh, some of the manuscripts include the oldest printed book in the world, the Diamond Sutra. And here you can see uh, a, a, a sky map displaying the full sky visible in the northern hemisphere. It's the oldest completed uh, and preserved star atlas known in any civilization. It is also the earliest known pictorial representation of the quasi-totality of the Chinese constellations. Now that the sand dunes above the caves have been stabilized, the number one threat to this site is humans. After a dramatic increase in visitors to the caves, there is um, extreme deterioration due to high levels of carbon dioxide and humidity. We could call this microclimate change. Currently at Dung Wan, most of the hundreds of caves need to be closed to the public to ensure their preservation, and there are only 10 open for viewing at any one time. It is possible that in the future all caves will close, similar to Lascaux Caves in France and the Altamira Caves in Spain. So providing new methods of access both on-site and around the world has been the driving factor in the development of Pure Land. 
Pure Land combines the laser scanning data of CAVE 220 and its optimized 3D model with the ultra high resolution photography of this cave. We're concentrating our efforts here on the sutra of the eastern pure land of the medicine Buddhas on the north wall. And we undertake a series of visualization strategies such as recoloring and restoration of mural paintings, 2D and 3D animations, and the use of 3D video to create an interpretive experience. Just to give you some uh, understanding of the scale of the activities there, to image a single cave, it takes three months, and the Dunghuan Academy employ 50 full-time photographers. We use the AV system as the experimental arena for this project, 360-degree 3D, 10 meters across, 4 meters high. It gives an approximate one-to-one -one scale experience of being inside this cave. Cave 220 is never open to the public, so this is a singular opportunity to, uh, for access to this site. This image is a laser scan of the escarpment at Dung Wan. The hundreds of cave e uh, entrances are visible amongst the, uh, underneath that enormous sand dune. And our work begins with an escarpment image browser. This uh, includes iconography of key, key caves, but at this stage you can only enter inside cave 220. We simulate what it's like to be the, there now. You're uh, led around the place with a torch, uh, and the guide will reveal the narrative experience using the torch. But in the virtual world, of course, uh, you can do many more things, and uh, there are many more powerful modalities for analysis. So we have created a series of tools such as this uh, magnifying glass. Given how dense these mural paintings are, this is uh, an extremely powerful way to begin to unlock uh, the density of information held there. In Hong Kong, we are fortunate to have many uh, Dung Wan scholars and uh, this, uh, if you put them inside this cave with the magnifying glass, it's about a two-hour interpretive experience. One of the other uh, visualization strategies is a recoloring of mural paintings based on the scholarship at Dung Wan. These are examples of uh, Buddha and two of the canopies that float above the Buddha. And these are the seven medicine Buddhas inside the cave. Another visualization strategy is the use of 3D modeling. The image that you're looking at is uh, uh, an incense burner at the foot of the medicine Buddha. These were all modeled in 3D, they're all different, and then placed back into the scene. For the uh, a novice visitor to the site, these things are ex uh, uh, very indistinct. The north wall of the cave is also significant for a number of performers and musical instruments, um, providing the overall harmony and celebratory atmosphere of this painting. And these instruments were also modeled in 3D, another useful didactic tool. And one of the final visualization strategies was to take advantage of live performances and 3D video capture. Uh, these are dance performances of Dung Wan dancers by Beijing Academy dancers filmed in a blue screen studio using stereo cameras. <laughs> The 
dancers recolored and inserted into the stereo scene. For the last two weeks, Pure Land has been installed at the Smithsonian Institute's Freer Sackler Gallery as part of its 25th year celebrations. The installation here is a signal of a significant shift in curatorial thinking in relation to digitally mediated experiences at an institution known for its aesthetic refinement and for emphasis on the aura of the real. The Washington Post correspondence notes, at last we have a virtual reality system that is worthy of inclusion in a museum devoted to the real stuff of art. This year, also at the invitation of the Hong Kong Art Fair, we took the basic data set of Pure Land and reconceived it within the constraints of the Art Fair exhibitor footprint. We built uh, an exact one-to-one -one scale uh, three walls uh, and printed the wireframe from the laser scan onto the walls of the booth. And we use a tablet as a visual corollary for the interface. Here, visitors are navigating both real space and virtual space at one-to-one -one scale. As they approach the wall, the images are exactly the same size as the real cave. You can also look at the roof. This video is important because it uh, uh, represents the powerful uh, aspects of single-user multi uh, spectator interfaces. Uh, there's a lot of requests these days for creating multi-user interfaces, everybody having their own screen, but the socialization that's happening around this particular screen is actually at the core or the heart of museum experience. And so it's important to recognize this in a culture where everyone has their own own screen iPhone. And this is also interesting because while women do the experience, men work out how it operates. So the guys here are figuring out that it's infrared cameras and it does tracking and... This work is currently installed at the Shanghai Biennale in, uh, in Shanghai, China. And just a few images that uh, demonstrate how versatile and how accessible this is through different age groups. It's a grandmother with her grandchild. A grandmother abandons grandchild to go off of the screen herself. Increasingly, technologies are coupled to cultural and natural heritage, resulting in new ontologies, heritage practices, and an unprecedented emergence of theoretical and practical challenges. The Pure Land projects provide groundbreaking conceptual, technological, and operational paradigms for the future of digital preservation, cultural heritage interpretation, and embodied museography. The museum, says Donald Preziosi, is a theater of anamorphic and autoscopic dramaturgy, a place in which it is not so easy to tell which is the spider and which is the web, which the machinery and which the operator. It is a place at the center of our world, our moder modernity, in the image of which those worlds continue to proliferate. Thank you. It's really fascinating to see all these creative and pioneering works. And uh, I'm sure this fascinates uh, quite a lot of us. Are there any questions you'd like to ask uh, and raise to uh, Professor Shore and uh, Sarah? Yes? Uh, would you please kindly stand up? Yes, yeah, thank you. I have a question for Sarah. There's a difference between um, when you visit a site, there are, there's the experiential quanti um, quality of smells, just looking around the space, how do you reduce the sacrifices of atmosphere and smells and all that in digital sure. preservation? Um, I, I agree with you. Uh, one of the things that we're working on are fully embodied experience. So, so 
smell, I guess, is the next level, the olfactory. Uh, the, the, the difference between going to a site and going to a virtual world that is at one-to-one -one scale, in these virtual worlds, we're offering extra tools uh, for exploring it. Uh, for instance, in the Humpy work also, there's no way that you could visit that site unless you stayed there for 10 days. So we're giving um, extraordinary access to range across places, which you cannot get if you're there unless you're spending an enormous amount of time. So they're, they're very different, uh, but they are fully embodied. And it does give you that sense of journeying, that sense of uh, uh, contemplation, traveling, or all these things that are important to visiting real sites, but it also gives you a set of tools for analyzing and uh, going deeper into the narratives that are embedded, and also to see things that you would not see, in fact, when you were there. So dealing with that intangible aspect and giving that a visual form. Maybe I had one point. Um, there's another aspect to this work which also um um, has an interesting uh, implication. Uh, for instance, some of the situations which we photographed at Humpy have now changed. In other words, the real world uh, which we photographed, with its smells, with its tastes, with its experiences, is now gone. I mean, when we, one of our panoramic images is of the bazaar, uh, which was a very dense social and wonderful situation. And uh, due to shift in governmental policy, they decided that this bizarre, bizarre had to go. So it was bulldozed in one night. It was completely bulldozed away. So the real world actually uh, is a fragile place. And sometimes the real world, um, sometimes these, these digital, uh, let's say, recordings or digital uh, become what we have left uh, of, uh, of a potential experience of these places. But again, this is not to say that the digital representation is in any way superior, right? It is a, a different uh, space of experience. Yes, there's another question, so, yeah. What do you see as the future of the visualization technology? Really, um, I mean, there are many pot potential futures, and of course, uh, these uh, technological media that we're working with are in a, a furious state of, uh, of evolution because uh, they serve so many interesting uh, purposes in, in, in contemporary life. So um, one can imagine uh, all kinds of, uh, of developments. Quite honestly, from our point of view, we are interested in what the current state of the art is in terms of new media resources and how we can uh, address current challenges, current challenges in the world of uh, art practice, in the world of uh, heritage preservation. So uh, I would say the interesting thing to do today is to look at the resources that are there today and understand how these already at this point in time have an extraordinary virtuosity. Uh, and uh, especially for uh, students in our time, there are enormous opportunities for uh, uh, discovering uh, new ways of, uh, of doing things. I can just add to that that uh, we are increasingly surrounded by massive data sets that are impenetrable. We don't know how to deal with it. And uh, visualization strategies are essential for uh, being able to make sense of these data sets. And especially if you look at something like the Tripitaka Koreana project that Jeffrey showed, it's 50 million characters. And the only way to see it, in fact, is to abstract it into a bunch of blue dots and put it on a very big screen. So the increasing trend between uh, uh, gigapixel imaging and large-scale display systems and huge data sets, that's a very strong trend in, in what we're doing. I have questions to ask you both. It's so admirable that uh, you apply all this really visionary and pioneering technology, creativeness, to historical well, something is very old, remote in a way, uh, the two. Why? What makes you find interest in this? And uh, uh, that's something which myself as an architect, interested in well, historical monuments, uh, be fascinated by your works. What's inside you that uh, brought this together? I, um, I'm an archaeologist, so I have that 
background, um, maritime archaeologist. Uh, but uh, World Heritage Sites are embedded with an enormous uh, latent potential for storytelling. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're incredibly rich places, obviously. Um, if you think of a place like Humpy with its conjunction of living uh, pilgrimage and World Heritage Site, uh, bringing these experiences to to the world is, a, is an enormous privilege and it's a, an endless and fascinating activity. Yes. Uh, what's also great about a work like that is it's now placed next door to the site itself, so it acts as an augmentation to going there as a person. I think if, in the history of art, it's not, um, it's not unexceptional that the past inspires the present. Uh, we, see it, we have seen it over and over again. Um, and the other uh, um, aspect is that uh, in my own art practice, working with new media, um, to some extent one is working with a material that has no history. Uh, so in other words, uh, these technologies, which are at the one hand are so versatile, yeah, they also somehow are empty shells. They, they've got a kind of, uh, they, they are somewhat uh, sort of, uh, anemic in themselves. So there is also a tendency to want to uh, uh, validate yeah, these, uh, these new media by infusing them yeah, with memory and infusing with the, with the past. In other words, to demonstrate that these resources do not cut us off from history, but can re, uh, realign us or re-engage us with history. That's very nice. Oh, that's, okay, maybe our last questions. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> Would you please stand up? Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I want to know, typically, uh, how many people are involved in one of these projects? Uh, and uh, Are these projects commercially viable? Because it looks like there is a lot of historian, anthropology, and all these people. And a lot of research has to be done before these uh, could be in place. I also want to ask you about what you think about the students uh, working in this area. In Hong Kong, I mean. The Dung Wan projects had 30 people working on them, so that's a large team. Some of them had small jobs, some of them had big jobs. Some of those, uh, uh, some of the animation and things like that, the recoloring of the base relief, that was all done by students. Uh, and the whole project took six months. I, I don't know if we can uh, really say that these are commercially viable yet. What they are is a, are experiments in working out what are sustainable methods of interpretation. This is one cave out of 492 that we could potentially do. And what we've done is create a, a series of software tools now and basic framework where many more caves can be just poured in, essentially. And uh, that becomes sustainable. We can do a vast amount with the, with the resources that we have now and what we've established around that project. So creating, I guess, frameworks for reuse and uh, for expanding into other sites, and this is, that's commercially viable, yes. And I think I should just add to give, when one is curious about the sort of, let's say, the economic framework in which a lot of these projects were done, I mean, a lot of these projects were done in the context of an art practice or in the context of research that's being done within universities, within the particular, or let's say the idiosyncratic kinds of research funding that one can get in, uh, in universities. And uh, a lot of these projects, quite honestly, are actually um, somewhat, you know, to some extent defined by the financial constraints which are there. So um, uh, uh, it's... Um, there's often uh, uh, strategies which involve uh, um, uh, looking for ways of, of, of e economy, you know, uh, uh, getting you know the maximum result from often situations where the resources are quite uh, are quite constrained. Um, but I think well, artists are used to that. They know how to, this is this is part of uh, our, our business to, to understand to work within. Um, um, often quite, quite significant financial constraints.
So thanks very much, uh, Professor Shaw and Sarah, for all the great works done in Alive Lab at the City University of Hong Kong. Thank you.